Good morning, this is Mark Richardson, uh, speaking from Vibrant Technology in California. Welcome to our monthly webinar. Uh, today we're going to review some material that was covered back in November, although we didn't get to the end of the story, so to speak. We didn't really use what we call facts, fault correlation tools, to demonstrate how we can uh, not only detect but uh, quantify or identify on balance in rotating machinery. So what we're going to do here today is use some data that was used back in November and prior to that even back in 2009 when the data was, was taken on this machine that you are looking at on the screen right now. It's a, it's a rotor kit. It's a, these rotor kits are sold by a, a company called SpectreQuest in Virginia. And you can see on this particular rotor kit, there are two blue cubes indicating uh, two triaxial accelerometers that were attached to the bearing blocks of this machine. And then we simulated seven different unbalance cases on the machine. So we turn the machine off and we put uh, little screws into these threaded holes on the two uh, discs that you can see on this machine. So we put a small uh, unbalance on the inboard, a small unbalance on the outboard, then a large unbalance on the inboard, a large unbalance on the outboard, and then we put unbalance weights on both of the discs. Uh, so we ran these different cases. They were all run at, uh, the data was taken at a, a running speed of 2,000 RPM. And the accelerometer data from these two accelerometers was used as an ODS in Emiscope. And we processed that data to determine and identify which unbalanced case from the data actually uh, had occurred. So we knew the answer when we started, collected the data, post-processed it in Emiscope, and then using the facts in our uh, Emiscope series called MSS, or Machine Surveillance Series, that adds some additional software and a larger database to Emiscope so that we can correlate the ODS data from the machine with stored ODS data in the database and when they correlate together uh, we can identify uh, various unbalanced cases and sort one from another simply from uh, the accelerometer data on these bearing blocks. So it's an extreme case uh, of simply taking the vibration of the machine at the bearings in the X, Y, and Z direction and using that as a, a metric or a discriminator for identifying an unbalanced situation. So this is a demonstration of some new capabilities that we've added in Emiscope and uh, I'm going to go through the details with you here in the next hour. Hopefully we're going to look at all this data and we'll look at it at, at uh, various orders, various running speeds uh, of the machine. Well, we'll run the machine at 2,000, we'll look at the ODS data at 2,000, at 4,000, and at 6,000. So the, the running speed, first order plus the, the second and third order data. Uh, we recently gave this, presented a, another technical paper. Now the first technical paper that we gave at the International Modal Analysis Conference back in uh, 2009. Uh, here's a copy of it. This is my Emiscope project here that I used just a month ago at the most recent iMac. But this data was originally taken back in 2009 on this machine and we we used some uh, slightly different discriminators. We had some different names. Let me just take you back and show you. All right, this is the original paper from February 2009. Uh, you can see uh, 
that this fellow here was the, Suri is his name, he's the uh, president of SpectraQuest. So this data was taken by SpectraQuest and then we processed it in MEScope. So there's a picture of the machine that we took the data on originally. It's called a fault simulator. We can simulate unbalance, misalignment, and various other things, bearing problems, and so forth. Uh, so the whole idea here is that we measure ODS data. And, and ODS, I'm sure you're familiar if you're listening in, and ODS is two or more uh, accelerometer measurements, two or more vibration measurements, uh, typically spatially separated, or in this case, XYZ, uh, at two different bearings on the machine. So we're going to compare baseline, what we call baseline ODS data, with current data, and there use that process of comparing the ODS data as a way to identify these machine faults. Uh, we invented some words back in 2009, something called a shape correlation coefficient. That really is more accurately called the modal assurance criterion. That was created by a professor at University of Cincinnati in his PhD thesis work many years ago, and we use it as a way of correlating two shapes. So we have since abandoned this idea of calling it a shape correlation coefficient. Uh, modal assurance criterion is the popular name for this calculation. You can see the math for it right there. We invented a new measure or metric back in 2009 when we were exploring the differences between ODS data, a baseline, and a current, and we came up with something called a shape percent difference. That In this paper, we used that and we, we did some comparisons of the ODS data for the various unbalanced cases, um, and that didn't work as well. So. In the meantime, we've created a, a new metric, which we call the shape difference indicator. And that's what we presented at this year's iMac. Again, using the same data off this machine, but rather than uh, using it at, at all the various locations uh, that we had taken data, uh, let me just see if we can look at this picture here. Well, I, I have some other pictures, and I'll show you that. Uh, originally, we had accelerometers on the base plate, and we had an accelerometer up here on the motor and so forth. Uh, here are the seven unbalanced cases that we, that we uh, measured or simulated, and then we took ODS data for them. So that same data is going to be used here in a, in a minute. Uh, but this paper as I said, it was given in 2009. Now this year we gave an updated version of this whole idea, and here is a copy of the, uh, uh, wow, installing update. I, I didn't ask for that, but it's, uh, okay, here we go. This is the paper from uh, this year, 2016, January, uh, entitled Up. Uh, using operating data to locate and quantify on balance. This is the topic of the day's discussion. And so here's another picture of the, the machine uh, showing accelerometers on the base plate and the motor and so forth, but we didn't use that data. And I'll show you how we can uh, restrict our use of just the accelerometers on the, ba on the bearing blocks. Here is an ODS FRF. These are the measurements that we took the uh, ODS data from. You can see the peaks at 2,000, at 4,000, at 6,000. Those are the peaks where we actually took the ODS data and put it into a database and compared with uh, archived, previously archived data for these various conditions. Um, here's another picture of the machine. And uh, now we're going to get into, here's the modal assurance criterion, same math as the previous paper. Uh, we've given up on that shape correlation coefficient. We're just going to call it MAC. And here's some math showing 
the uh, shape difference indicator. A little bit different formula, but similar to MAC. So let me go and review some of this with some better graphics here. Uh, I'm going to open this one. Here is a picture of the software architecture. Now, MEScope is simply a, a software program. Here you can see that we've got something called Mechanicom. Now, we, that used to be our, our brand for this type of software, the machine surveillance software. We've now just simply rebranded it as MEScope Machine Surveillance Series. And the idea here is that MEScope is running in either out in the field in, in, a, in a Pelican box like this, or it's just running on your computer and it's attached to your, your multi-channel acquisition system. And it's running under program control, macro program control, and it's feeding data into a large SQL database. So that's what's called the Mechanicom database here. And then out of the database, we have a new program called the console. So we simply call it the MEScope console or the console program where we can look at the data that's been logged into the database. And we can do trend plots and animations, but the thing we're going to focus on today is the fault correlation tools, or we call it facts. So we're going to get into the mathematics of the facts calculation and how that works with this particular uh, architecture. Let me see what else I have here. These are added files. Um, now, added files are not part of the MEScope project file itself. The data is actually stored in separate files, and MEScope has a link to, in this case, a, a a JPEG, a, a picture of the the uh, experimental setup. So you can see here from this picture that when the data was originally taken, we had accelerometers down here on the base plate, we had one on the motor, uh, and we had one on each of the bearing blocks. Now in MEScope, we can simply select the data, the ODS data, from the bearing blocks. So we're using the same data set that we created nine back in 2009, and we're going to just work with the data from the, the two bearing blocks. Let me, here's another picture of it. You can see all the wires going out the back, and uh, that's just another view of the, the rotor kit. We're going to come back to this. This is a, this is a plot of the shape difference indicator, and it's very critical that this indicator uh, has a property that we're going to take advantage of wherein the value of the shape indicator goes to zero down here uh, when one of the shapes, now the U's and the V's are ODS's or shapes, they could be mode shape, they could be an ODS, doesn't matter. In this case, they're, uh, they're just scalars which is the extreme case of a shape where we just got one component. Uh, and when one of the shapes is zero, you can see that the value of the uh, SDI, that's what this is, goes to zero. We'll come back to that. Uh, here are, here's a picture of the machine again with the unbalanced uh, inboard rotor weights, outboard rotor weights. These are where we attached uh, little screws to the, we screwed them into the, uh, into these rotors and created the unbalanced conditions. All right, well, let's put this down. And here is my project that we built for uh, looking at this data in MEScope and also for archiving it into the archival database so that we can look at it on the other side using the facts capability or the fault correlation tools. You can see we got a number of shape tables. We got a, uh, an STR, a structure file. That's the structure file that's open. The, that's a photo model of this machine. And if I 
go to the photo model and, and or to the uh, structure model and turn off the photographs. Underneath is what we would call a surface model. So every photo model has a surface model underneath of it, and if I turn back the photographs on, I'm simply uh, Windows is simply displaying the photographs on the surface. So for engineering, looking at your engineering data, the, the surface models are often uh, easier to look at, clearer, although the photo model certainly can add details, you know, names and warnings and labels and so forth. Uh, so we can handle either one of those in ME scope. Let's go back to the simpler model here. Uh, under this project, we've got a number of shape tables. So here's our data for the 2,000, 4,000, 6,000 RPM. We'll look at that in a minute. Uh, and then we've also got a number of macro programs here. So you can see they've got various labels on them. And rather than look at the details of the macro programs, uh, we're simply going to execute them with hotkeys. The hotkeys are up here on the toolbar. And if I put the mouse on the hotkeys, uh, you can see they each have a label. Let's just go look at the hotkeys first. Here's where they were defined in this project under hotkey setup. Let me open that up. And so now you can see here's a spreadsheet where the hotkeys have been defined. And they have a name. So we have the balance condition, the small inboard, small outboard, large inboard, outboard, and three other cases where we had weights on both wheels at zero degrees, at 90 degrees, 180 degrees. Each hotkey will execute a macro program. So here are the macro programs that have been created. The machine name is the name that we've given this machine in the archival database. And then here is an icon for the hotkey and a description. So you can see we've got a number of different hotkeys down here. We've got the first order data, the second order, the third order. Here's a hotkey that enables the archiving of this data into the database and a start over key that kind of gets everything organized in MEScope for me. So this is a very typical setup here of a project where I can, once this is set up, I can just go use the hotkeys and look at all my data. So let me start over here and I'm going to press uh, the start over button and it's arranging windows on the screen and it's pulling up some data. And now I've got an animation. This is our comparison animation in a side-by-side -side format. And you can see I've got rotating parts during the animation. Uh, MEScope will sync those up. If I give an RPM to the rotating parts, it'll sync them up with the RPM of the data that I'm looking at. So in this case, it's 2,000 RPM, the machine is the rotating part is going around at exactly the same speed as the sinusoidal animation of the ODS. So that way I can look at order tracked or order related ODS data. Over here is the MAC value of these two shapes. So whenever I have a comparison display, I can turn on the MAC value and here is the SDI, or the shape difference indicator of these two shapes. Now, where do we turn that on? That's in the options box. I open the structure options box. Right here on the animation tab, I can put up various legends, the, the amplitude and speed that's down here in the lower left corner. And under the compare shapes, I can turn on the MAC and the SDI. So that's those where I display those when I'm doing a comparison display of these two shapes. So this came up in the baseline. You can see over here that here's my data for 2000 RPM. Uh, let me just drag this across here and you can see it a little better. Um, here's the 2000 RPM data with the 
eight cases, the balanced case we call baseline, and then seven unbalanced cases. Down here is, let me just uh, do this for a second here, get a little better look maybe at what we're, okay, this is, this is now showing the baseline shape data, which is animating on the left, and the unbalanced shape, which again is the baseline animating on the right. So both the MAC and the SDI are the same. They're 100%. They're saying these two shapes are identical. If we look at the data here, uh, now we're actually showing all of the degrees of freedom. That is not what I expected, uh, but let's go on here and let's try the small inboard. I'm going to push that button, that hot key. Okay, so now you can see that uh, on the left is still the baseline, and on the right, here's the baseline down here, and, the, and so it arranged things a little differently for me. Uh, on the right is the uh, small inboard ODS data. You can see the MAC dropped a little bit, SDI dropped a whole bunch, indicating these are different shapes. Let's try another one. Again, you can see the animation is increasing. Now, the reason that is so is because under my animate menu, under compare shapes, I'm scaled relative to the left shape. So, what that means is that the right shape is animating with an amplitude relative to the left shape. So as we go to a more severe unbalanced case, the right should move more due to the unbalance than the left, which is the balanced case. Let me try number three here. Okay, you can see that we still got a strong indication that these are different shapes. Let's go to number four. Now number four is, if I look over here under, in this file here, there I've got it selected. That is the large inboard. So a, a larger unbalance on the inboard rotor. Let me put this back here. and Let's go. Um, large inboard, here's the large outboard. Now you can see that the animation is clearly indicating a, a more severe case. The MAC value is not 100, so it's indicating a difference, and the SDI is essentially zero, so it's indicating a fairly severe. Uh, let's see, what did I push there? Number five was the large outboard. Okay, number six is two large weights at zero degrees. So we simply added another weight to the inboard and now uh, now you can see the machine is on the loose end here away from the mass of the motor. It's really moving around quite a bit uh, because of the, the weights being at zero degrees, they are causing the most severe unbalance. Number seven, here's where they're at 90 degrees. Now, again, the indicators are telling us that the, the ODS is different, but uh, the animation is saying it's not as severe as the, the previous case. And now number eight is where they are at 180 degrees. So large, unbalanced, but at 180 degrees from each other. So they're, they're counteracting each other in a sense, and the vibration level has gone down. Well, let's look at this data. We've seen it here in animation. Let me stop this and just look at the data uh, by using the MAC and SDI calculations themselves. Before I do that, let's go back and review the SDI calculation a little bit because that curve that I showed you earlier 
we're going to take advantage of here um, in a moment. So I want to bring this tech paper back up again and let's go down here and just look at some of this math. Uh, the MAC values, we saw the MAC values, that's the standard formula. There are two problems with MAC that make it perhaps not a good metric for detecting these different unbalanced cases or sorting them out. One is that it just measures collinearity. So it doesn't matter what the amplitudes of the shapes are, the two shapes. Again, we're comparing a, a stored shape, an archive shape with a with a, a current shape. Now, in the animation, we were simply comparing the balanced case with the unbalanced. In a minute, we're going to try to sort out which case we actually have. Uh, you notice when I was going through the animations, the MAC values for the various unbalanced cases were all about 80%, 0.8. But I couldn't discriminate one from the other uh, just using that MAC value. Problem is that it just measures collinearity, which means the two shapes lie on the same straight line. So if the shapes are not on the same straight line, now that's a little hard to imagine when we get beyond two dimensions, but mathematically it's the same idea. The Another way of thinking of the collinearity is that the dot product between two shapes. Now you mathematicians know what a dot product is. I simply multiply one shape uh, transposed by the other and I get a number. If the number is one, they're the same. If it's less than one, they're at right angles to each other or they're not collinear. The other problem is that MAC only works for two or more shape components, so it will not work for scalar values. Now that's a similar property to coherence, which some of you are familiar with. If I only have one average or one sample of data of an FRF or a cross-spectrum, uh, when I'm signal processing, the coherence is always one. Same problem with the MAC value. If I only have one shape component, the answer is always one. So I can't discriminate between two scalars, two temperatures, for instance, or two pressures. So we created this new thing called SDI at, at Vibrant. As far as I know, it's unique to us. We didn't find it anywhere else being used and the idea here is that we can actually measure with a number between 0 and 1 the difference between two shapes. So if you look at the numerator here, here's a shape U and a shape V. In the numerator I have a difference and it's the magnitude squared and then I'm dividing by uh, the summation of the magnitude squared of the two vectors. The U H, which is Hermitian, that stands for, that's a transposed conjugate. We do that with complex data. Uh, think of it as just the length or the magnitude of a U vector and the same for the U vector or the V vector. We add them together. This whole term here is subtracted from one and we end up with a different formula here. But the values of the SDI, just like MAC, are always between 0 and 1. Here's some typical values. If V equals U, the shapes are the same, the answer is 1. If V equals 0 or U equals 0, the answer is 0. That's what I mentioned previously. When we plot out the SDI curve, if either shape is 0, then the answer is 0. And you can kind of see that up here uh, by looking at this formula here. Twice the real part of the the dot product or U transpose conjugate multiplied by the V vector. For those of you that are getting snowed under by the mathematics here, just think of, take the conjugate out of there, think of real numbers. I'm just multiplying one number by the other. I can do that with this calculation and uh, so it doesn't matter whether a vector or a scalar Multiply them together. If one of them is zero, the answer is zero. If V is twice the magnitude of U, again, think of the numbers. V is one, U is, uh, or U is one, and V is two. 
SDI is 64%, so that's a strong indication that they're different. If one vector is 10 times the other vector, think of U as 1, V as 10, then SDI is very close to zero. So let's look at this curve here. Let me see if I have, okay, here's the curve that I showed you earlier. This is a curve of the SDI values for scalars U and V. So it works for scalars and it, it works the same for vectors. In other words, if U and V have more than one shape component. Again, we're talking, we're talking ODSs here, operating deflection shapes, accelerometer data from uh, the two bearing block tracks or accelerometers. So what this is showing us here is that if V is 100, and I'm trying to compare U and V, and so the horizontal axis here would be the values of U, when V is 100, this, this curve is very flat. And that means it's not very sensitive to the difference between U and V. But as V gets closer to zero, here it is for V equal to 10, and then here it is for V equal to one. As it gets closer to zero, the, the STI curve gets very peaked or very steep or very sensitive to the difference between U and V. Well, we're gonna use that in order to change the sensitivity of our STI calculation. And here's how we do it. This is real simple and I'll show it to you in the software because it's built into Emiscope now. If I replace the view, the V vector with this sensitivity value, in other words, I'm just going to, I'm just going to store a bunch of numbers equal to one for V in all of its components. And then I change U to be the difference between the original U and V plus the sensitivity value. And I plug that number, those two numbers into the SDI calculation. Now I'm working on the steep part of the curve where if there's any difference between U and V, it is very, it's going to be a, a huge drop in the value of the SDI. Let's go back and take a look at our data here. I'm going to open up uh, a shape table with all the shapes in it. Now, we weren't animating with just these numbers. In other words, the accelerometer data at point one and at point two. Those are the two points on, here, let me go back and show you. Um, I'm going to make this large and let's put the point labels on. So there are the point labels that I've labeled one and two. Those two tracks are accelerometers. So the data from points one and two, put that back down again, and let's get the uh, unbalanced case up here. I'm just gonna select the ODS data from points one and two. Here's the data for the eight different cases. Remember the first case is the baseline or balanced, and then the seven unbalanced cases. Let me unselect that. I'm going to go display the MAC value. Now it's saying you got things selected here. Do you want to unselect? I'm going to say no. And now it's going to say, what do you want to compare it with? I'm going to compare the shapes with themselves. Because I want to see if we can discriminate one case from another. And again, it's asked me the same question because I selected the same shape table. Here are the MAC values. Now remember this bar chart here is showing, over here is the balance case, shape number one versus shape number one. Its value is one. Obviously it's the same shape. Here is shape number two with shape one and it's about 82%. So those are the values that we saw, that this first row here of MAC values are the the values that we saw when we compared any of the unbalanced cases in the comparison animation with the balanced case. 
So you can see they're all right around 80 percent in this number seven here, it dropped down to 74 percent. But all these other MAC values are the one ODS compared with a different one. So here, there's, here's an unbalanced case compared with all the other unbalanced cases. And you can see that there's a MAC value of one, so there's no way to discriminate those two unbalanced cases. In other words, all the off-diagonals in this in this matrix of uh, MAC values are any of those that are close to one are not going to be able to sort out uh, for us which case we actually have as an unbalanced case. Let's go and put up the SDI values. So display, here's SDI right here. And I'm going to say no. And now I'm going to select the same set of data. And I'll say no. So here it is for the selected bearing block data. SDI is doing a better job because the off diagonals, see here, here it is, here's the balance versus all the unbalance. Those are very close to zero. We saw those when we animated. All these other off diagonals are comparing one unbalance with a different unbalance. And you can see that they're discriminating quite well, except for a few of the cases. Here's one that's at 99%. So uh, number seven and shape seven and shape five, the, that is case seven and case five of the unbalance, uh, those are almost the same ODS. It's, it's saying they're 99% the same. Here's another case that's 97%, uh, case number eight and case number three. So I'm looking up, you know, in the above where I've moved the mouse pointer around and it's telling me the value of that particular bar. So again, uh, SDI is doing a little better job, but it's not doing a great job because there's a couple of cases here that it can't discriminate. Now, if you notice over here on SDI, there's a scroll bar now, and this is something relatively new in MEScope that we've added, because this is the sensitivity scroller, and as I move this scroll bar, uh, it's not showing me my sensitivity value, but the sensitivity is increasing. Actually, as I scroll up, I am moving the V vector one of the shape pair closer to the origin, and I'm comparing a number close to the origin of the curve with the difference between the two ODSs relative to that sensitivity. So as I push this all the way up, you can see that now, as I've made the ODS uh, comparison using SDI, very sensitive. And this value up here is actually one over 10 or one tenth. I've moved it very close to the origin. Now all the off diagonal terms go to zero. And what that says is that these shapes are clearly different than one another. So what we've done here is, is run our data through a discriminator that is now very sensitive to any difference in their magnitudes, in their actual values. Can't do that with the MAC values. This is only something that's going to work for um, the SDI because the SDI curve gets steeper as we move one of the shapes closer to the origin. So back here looking at this curve again, let's just take one more look. And what we did there was to uh, I think this is the one right here. No, that's not it. I've got it in here as a uh, Uh, no, that's not it either. Well, this, 
I can show it to you here because this is a copy of the the PowerPoint slides that we presented at the IMAC conference. So let me come down here and um, here's the curve that I want you to see. So SDI is zero when either U or V is zero. SDI becomes more sensitive as V approaches zero. So that's what I'm talking about here. As we increase the sensitivity, uh, the SDI indicator, the shape difference indicator, became a stronger metric or a more sensitive metric of the difference between two unbalanced cases. And we did that by replacing the V vector with the sensitivity value and the U vector with the difference between the two vectors plus the sensitivity. So we're looking at changes between the two ODS vectors. To distinguish between a pair of ODS vectors, a sensitivity should be chosen which drives the risk to UVI as close as possible to zero. That's what we're doing here. So if we go back and look at the the data here, you can see that it's a it's a very strong indicator. That's the first order. Now let me go get the second order data. I'll put this one down and let's open up the this is the unbalance for the second order. Again, I'm going to just select the bearing block data, not, not all of the data that we took on the base plate and the motor. And now let's just look at, again, if we look at the MAC real closely, let's just see what the MAC values look like. Well, MAC is a little more sensitive to differences using the second order, but here's an area right in here where I cannot distinguish between those severe unbalanced cases. These were the ones where we had the, the, uh, the two unbalanced weights, cases uh, five, six, and seven in that area there. Those, those cases are all Mac cannot distinguish between them. Let's let's go look at uh, SDI, and again, it's being telling me that things are selected. Okay, SDI, even with no sensitivity, down here when this slider is at the bottom, it's just the standard SDI algorithm. Uh, you can see that we still have a case here of 88 percent. A rule of thumb is anything over 90% is the same, anything less is different, but 88% is kind of borderline. But let's crank the sensitivity up here and see what happens. Okay, I just cranked it. You can see that as, as I change it, uh, I don't necessarily get a really good case here. Uh, some of these other ones are not showing a good difference, but now Okay, we got it down to 85% using the second order data. So sometimes people say, well, just use a higher order, it's more sensitive. Actually, the running speed, the first order in this case, is probably better. However, we've gotten, with a higher sensitivity, we've got a pretty strong indication of the differences here. Let's go look at the third order and see how well this works on that. So we're, we're looking at a lot of different data here to see how can we discriminate these different unbalanced cases one from another. Okay, we'll go in and display the MAC value. This is 6,000 RPM now. This is, well, you can see that MAC got a lot better, but we still have one case here, 93% between uh, case 7 and case 5 where it didn't quite, it wasn't strong enough. But if I were only had the MAC values as a discriminator, I'd probably use the third order data because it is more sensitive to these various unbalanced cases. Let's go look at SDI, crank its sensitivity and see what we're 
toolkit for that. Okay, here it is, just the base algorithm, 85%, that's pretty good. So we don't even need a, uh, an increased sensitivity. We can use the standard algorithm, and the worst case here is, is still going to allow us to discriminate. Let's just crank it up all the way to the top, and it went down to 80%. So we, we have a, a little bit stronger discriminator when we increase the sensitivity of the SDI uh, by using this slide bar here. Not so bad without it on the third order data, but we got an even stronger indicator. All right, now I'm going to go back and show you how we use this in FACTS, uh, which is our fault correlation tool as part of the machine surveillance series software. So let me close this. I'm going to go back and hit the start over button. It kind of puts everything uh, back in order here on my in my ME scope display. Okay, so there it is. I've got the point labels turned on. I can turn that off. And there's the balance case. Let's go look at the worst unbalanced case, number six. And there you can see, again, a review of the worst case. Now I'm going to push this button, which says Archive in Database. So now it's going to tell MEScope for whatever case I'm looking at here, which is the worst case, uh, let's, let's start pushing these ODSs into the database. Okay, I'm going to put MEScope down now because it's, we say it's running under the hood. I'm going to open up the console, or it could be running in a remote Pelican box out on a, in the field, and okay, let's go back here with the console, and the first thing we want to look at is the machine gallery. So this is a picture of all the machines that I have in the database that I am monitoring, or in our lingo, in our surveillance, we're surveilling, we're doing a surveillance of vibration of these various machines. So you can see I've got some different names here uh, of machines that I've got in the database on my computer. And this one here, because I MEScope is now archiving data into the database for this machine, it says the machine is on. Uh, there's no MEScope running on my network that's putting any data into the database for these other machines right now. They're all offline. So if I double click on this, now this is our fax picture, but let's go and uh, start an animation. Uh, I want to bring up the model. Okay, so here's, here's the model. I'm going to go and use some of my tools here for the model. I want to compare it. Uh, now this model is not animating very well. I probably want to crank the speed up a little bit. And there's a little bit of a problem here because I'm not looking at my baseline on the left or my balance case. Here are all the hotkeys that I created in MEScope. So not only does MEScope pass data through the database, it passes the hotkeys. So I can remotely control MEScope from the console. The console is a free program. You can have it on as many computers as you want. You can have the database in the cloud, on the internet, and uh, MEScope can be connected to the cloud and collecting data out in the field or wherever. So, or it can all run on the same computer as I've got it running here. This is what we call network-based. Let me go back and do the baseline case here and uh, see if that updates properly. Uh, well, I've got a little bit of a problem here with the animation. Let me go back and and make this smaller here. Okay, so I've got a lot of different things 
to look at now. I've created, these are called panels in the console, a little bit different than Emmyscope. Uh, let me just make this larger here. I'm going to close this panel because I already have one open. So here's some gauges. Here's all my data coming in from uh, from Emmyscope. There's a, this is the shape data, and if I come over here under Big Rotor, and, and we call them gauges here, uh, you can see the data that's come in, and uh, let me just put the animation down for a minute and let's just look at something called facts. If I go back to my home, the first thing I did to set up the facts was I created some events and here they are. Let me just make them large so you can see. So as the data came in off of the trend plot, plot I identified each of the ODSs as a particular unbalanced case. So you can see down here first order and there's cases one through eight. So this is balanced through all the unbalanced. Here's second order case one through eight, third order case one through eight. So I've already identified in the database uh, the 24 different unbalanced cases, balance and unbalanced, in the database and facts. Now, if I look at the facts, uh, let me put this back in. This is the bar chart that works just like this is using SDI. It works just like the SDI calculation in MEScope, only it does a top 10 comparison. So it takes all its data in the database and says, Give me the top 10 values of SDI for this data that match data in my database that I've identified as uh, one of these unbalanced cases. So let me just go under the, the, the facts bar definition. And here you can see that I've got, uh, I can edit, let me just edit the bar. So here I'm showing all of the data. Let's, let's change that and just use the, the accelerometer data, just like we did in, uh, let me see if I can get this to work here. Okay, I just want to use the accelerometer data from the bearing blocks. So I'm going to identify my facts bar uh, with using that data that's been archived into the database. And now you can see this picture has changed here a little bit. My, uh, this is my sensitivity. I've cranked it up to 10. Now that's the same as the sensitivity scroll bar in MEScope. So now we're doing it with the facts software in the console. And what I want to do here, as I put this on here, you can see this is saying that this one that I've just put in here is the first order case number one. Well, let me go up here and push a different hotkey. Let's go push the severe case here, number six. And now Emmyscope is being told to push the data for number six into the database. This now fax is saying first order number six, the value of SDI is in fact one. If I put it down here, you can see all the other values. And this is because we've made the SDI very sensitive and the off diagonal values of all these other orders in the database, uh, all these other unbalanced cases are very close to zero. You can see the numbers up there on the top as I drag the, the bar, uh, the mouse along these various bars. So I can go and push any one of these cases. There's a small inboard. Uh, Emmyscope is running in the background. There it is, first order number two. 
And again, it's a strong indicator that that is the unbalanced case that the machine is now experiencing. Let me try another one. Let's go up here and try number eight. So Emmyscope is being told to push that data into the database, and there it is. Fax has identified it. Uh, let's go to the second order. So that's going to be second order number eight. And it's also, Emmyscope can push a little text into the database along with the shape data, uh, telling the operator what Emmyscope just did. So this is coming, this little message here is coming from Emmyscope. But if I go down here to facts, you can see that uh, this is the second order of case number eight. It's identified it. And the second best was the third order case number one, but still a very, that's down at 70%, so it's still found the second order case number eight. Let's go back, second order case number one, the balance case, and see how, how well that does. There it is, second order case number one, and all the other, here's the next closest fax bar, it's the third order number three. So it's comparing all the data in its database with the current and telling me what's going on. We can go to the third order. And so what we've got here is a very strong discriminator. There it is, third order case number one. That was the last case that Emmyscope pushed in. Let's try case number six, third order. I'm having a little problem with my display driver, but the software is continuing to run. There it is, third order case number six. So you can see that we've got something here that's a little stronger than the Mac for de determining the difference between two shapes. As I said, it'll work on scalars. I can select any data out of my shape data. And if I were monitoring bearing temperature along with vibration, I could have another fax bar next to this one that was simply comparing temperatures with various fault conditions. You know, if the temperature went varied by a certain amount from uh, a fault condition that I've identified, uh, or if it was close to that condition, then it would identify that with a different fax bar. Uh, we spent an hour. Uh, Brian, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, no, there aren't. All right. I, I, I apologize. I should have asked you at the beginning of the webinar if you had questions. I know we covered a lot of material here. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we always uh, solicit questions from listeners. Uh, next month, we're going to cover a different topic. Each month, we'll cover a different topic using Emmyscope. But I hope this one was... Uh, informative and useful for you, showing you some of the new capabilities of our Emmyscope machine surveillance software series. So long for now. Talk to you soon. Bye.